Thank you again to our orchestra. We have been blessed to hear them all morning, those of us that have been here all morning. As they make their departure, I will say to you that if you have a uh, rigid, preconceived idea of when this church service is supposed to end, you might want to uh, bid adieu and leave with them and have a happy Sabbath. Or you can stay and have a happy Sabbath too, I hope. The Sabbath school lesson talked about God being the musician of our universe. We have a good example of that in our orchestra today. People can make beautiful sounds through the power of an instrument. Well, I can remember being called out of class one day when I was in grade 8, along with two of my fellow classmates, Bob and Daryl. Now, you may be thinking, oh, we must have been misbehaving and we were being sent off to the principal's office for a little visit. But, oh, no, it was for a noble purpose that we had been summoned. You see, Mr. Robinson, the grade 6 teacher there at College Park Elementary School where I was attending in Oshawa, had specifically requested that we three be excused from our classes in grade 8 so that we could assist him during the grade 6 physical education period. This is not us, but just to uh, get you in the zone. So why had he called us out? Well, Mr. Robinson had also been our grade 6 teacher as well. In fact, we were the first grade 6 class that he taught. He had been our teacher in grade 5 and for whatever reason, that year he moved with us to become our grade 6 teacher. One of the activities that he used to have us do for gym class was a three-person running relay race in the gymnasium. And the way it worked was quite simple. There was nothing uh, earth-shattering about it. The class would divide up into teams of three, and then each team would line up behind a line at one end of the gym. When Mr. Robinson blew the whistle, then the first person in the team would run down across the gym, touch the wall at the other end, run back. When that first person crossed the starting line, the second person on the team would do the same thing, run down, touch the wall, and run back. Then the third person. And the way it worked was each person in the team needed to be able to repeat that run ten times. And then after your tenth time, you would sit down behind the line at the uh, starting area. So the first team sitting in a row behind the line would be the ones who won the race. Well, it just so happened that Bob, Daryl, and myself were the three fastest runners in our grade 6 class. So whenever Mr. Robinson would announce that this was what we were going to do to start off the gym class, when he would announce this relay, we always teamed up so that we could be assured of victory. Wasn't that nice of us? Selfless, kind of, or selfish, maybe? Because there was nothing quite as sweet as seeing the look of, of terror, or perhaps it was disgust, on the faces of the other teams when they would see, you know, our first runner was already sitting down. Maybe they were only like on lap eight or something. Oh, it was wonderful. Well, apparently, um, Mr. Robinson had actually kept a record of our best time on this relay. And as it turned out now, a couple of years later, this could be my only claim to fame, a couple of years later, no other grade 6 class uh, team had been able to match or beat our record. So I suppose to perhaps help spur his present grade 6 class students to greater heights, maybe uh, create a little buzz in the PE class, he arranged for us to come to their class and run this relay against them. He said, we're bringing in the record holders to run against you. Well, as Mr. Robinson announced our presence, man, we sauntered into that gymnasium full of mere little grade sixers, exuding an air of humble confidence befitting the true world champions that we were. But I'll have to tell you, as we walked in there, the truth is, as I remember back to those days, that, that inside, in my mind, I wasn't feeling nearly quite as confident as my outward demeanor portrayed, because you can't let them know that you're worried. But I was worried, truthfully. 
You see, I, I knew that Bob and Daryl were still faster runners than me. They were always faster than me, although I was pretty, pretty close with Daryl, but Bob was always faster, so that was okay. I knew they were still faster. But the problem was, the thing that was plaguing me was that between grade six and grade eight, a new student had come to our class named Robert, and he was faster than me as well. You know, I got bumped down to fourth place. And as we walked in there, I was thinking, you know, if, if Mr. Robinson had known about Robert, if he had knew, known that Robert was faster than me, I was wondering, would he have still asked me to run in this relay? And then I started wondering and thinking and worrying about the fact, you know, maybe I wondered if Bob and Daryl were wishing that they were running this relay with Robert instead of with me. And then worst of all, what came to my mind, I thought, what if, what if the absolute unthinkable were to happen? You know, what if some measly little grade six trio were to actually beat us? It was hard to imagine, but what if it happened? What would happen then? Would my teammates blame it on me? Well, if Darren wasn't so slow, would Mr. Robinson regret having me come to his class to run? Man, all of this stuff was in my head. And you know, and it's, it doesn't sound like a big deal now, right? But at the time, man, it was... And then I think back on this experience. And you know what's really nice as I think back about that? What's really nice is that if Bob and Daryl did have any doubts about having me run with them, they certainly, they never let on that they did. There was no, no indication. Neither they nor Mr. Robinson did anything to justify the questions that were floating around in my head and causing me concern. You know, my teammates, they actually seemed happy to have me as a part of their team. And I'm happy to report to you that we stunned that grade six class with a display of pure blistering speed. I know you didn't see it when we went to the track meet with Willowdale, but pure blistering speed and sheer athleticism such as I'm sure they had never seen in their young little grade six lives. Oh yeah, maybe you've even heard about it, I don't know, but probably not. And as I can recall, some of them were trying to mask the, the wonder and the amazement that they must have felt by, you know, complaining that it, this wasn't a fair race because we were two years older. Lame excuses, lame excuses. And I'll bet that if you had asked some of those kids in grade six, even, oh, say, even later that afternoon, I would bet that at least some of them would have still been able to remember and recall the way those three grade eight boys had burned up the gymnasium floor. And the legend would live on. All right, so we better go to the Bible. Let's look at a Bible text. You can look at a Bible text with me. First verse of Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. In the New Testament, <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. <clears throat> Excuse me, Romans chapter 15, verse 1. This is the text I'd like us to think about today. Romans 15, verse 1. <clears throat> it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Today I would like us to consider the meaning of these words of counsel. And of course, the best way to do that <clears throat> is to first of all look at the context in which we find this verse. In Romans 14, Paul has been discussing weak and strong Christian believers and how they should relate to one another. And using the examples of abstaining from food that had been sacrificed to idols and also the example of continuing to observe the Jewish ceremonial feasts and holy days, using those examples, Paul notes that some Christians are weaker in faith than other Christians. He's saying that these weak Christians hold to certain regulations and scruples which they believe will help them to be more righteous and thus help assure their salvation. Now, the, the stronger Christians that he describes, they are the people who understand more fully the doctrine of righteousness by faith. They realize that some of these regulations that their weaker brothers and sisters believe are necessary are not really binding on Christians. They know that righteousness only comes by accepting in faith the gift of Jesus Christ's perfect life to cover your past and the gift of the Holy Spirit's power to be able to live now. So when Paul here refers to the strong and the weak Christians in Romans 15, verse 1, 
he's speaking of those who are strong and weak in faith in the context of what all he has been saying in chapter 14. And it's interesting to note that Paul includes himself, as perhaps maybe many of us would do. He includes himself among the strong Christians. He writes, we then that are strong. So Paul is calling on the stronger Christians to be big enough to accept those who are weaker in spite of their weaknesses and failings, or as the New King James Version puts it, in spite of their scruples. And the motivation to be able to do this, as Paul has stressed over and over again all through chapter 12 and chapter 13 and chapter 14, the motivation is love. Without the basis of love for one another, this acceptance that Paul has been calling for, let's face it, it simply will not happen. The stronger believers are called to accept those who are weak, and likewise the weaker Christians are called to accept their stronger brothers and sisters. And then Paul kind of sums it all up in chapter 15, verse 7, when he writes, Therefore receive one another, just as Christ received us to the glory of God. <clears throat> so the context of this appeal to strong Christians in Romans 15:1 is that of respect, and consideration for one's fellow church members. You know, in the last half of Romans 14, Paul was specifically speaking to the strong Christians. And what we find here in the first verse of chapter 15 is really kind of a summary appeal. It's kind of a conclusion of what he's been saying to them that takes into account all that he was saying in the last part of chapter 14. So Paul has been encouraging the stronger Christians to Avoid putting a stumbling block in the way of their weaker fellow Christians. In other words, he's asking them to avoid doing something that may hinder the spiritual growth of those who are a bit weaker in faith. And even though the gospel gave them, yeah, freedom to do certain things, freedom to not have to do certain other things, he's saying to them, come on, out of love and respect for the convictions of others. Take those into consideration. He's saying you should be willing to restrict your freedoms so that you won't spiritually discourage or harm your spiritual siblings in Christ. He's saying to them, look at the salvation, the preservation of one for whom Jesus has died. Think about that. And he said, if you think about that, the sacrifice that you're called to make is really not such a big deal. It's a small one. In the light of eternity, really, is it such a big deal? But by making this appeal to stronger Christians in Romans 15.1, is Paul then suggesting that it's fine to remain a weak Christian? Is he condoning spiritual weakness? And this is where we must, of course, balance this counsel that we find here with the teaching that we find in the rest of the Scriptures. This idea of growth in one's relationship with God, we find that all throughout the Bible. It's... it's Christians are called to an ever stronger faith. They're called to an ever deeper understanding of God and His will. That's, that's what is necessary, the Bible says. For example, in 2 Peter 3.18, Christians are encouraged to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 4.15, Paul calls for Christians to grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ. This call to grow is all through the Bible. So while strong Christians are asked to accept and love those weaker in faith, realizing that they bring certain failings and unnecessary scruples with them, the other side of that coin is that those who are inexperienced and weak believers, they also need to be willing to grow. Grow in their understanding of God's principles and the Christian life and what it's about. Rather than just stagnate in their immature level of faith, they must be open to a, a clearer understanding of truth, which sometimes actually calls for what seems like an unusual thing to let go of certain beliefs that have been traditionally held. Paul calls the stronger Christians to be willing to accept those who are weak along with their weaknesses, but he isn't suggesting in doing that that they excuse or endorse sin, nor is he in telling them to encourage spiritual stupidity. Paul's counsel does not mean that if your Christian brother believes that it's fine to rob a bank, well, just, you know, out of consideration for his convictions, just go ahead and agree with him and say, God bless you, brother. 
No, I mean, this is an area in which God's law is very clear, right? Robbing banks is not part of the Christian life. You don't say, well, I wouldn't want to offend his scruples. How does this thing work? Now, suppose that you are always taught that after prayer, you are to keep your eyes closed and you are to be silent for a minimum of 33 seconds. Eyes closed, silent, 33 seconds. Now, to my knowledge, the Bible does not stipulate this. But what if you had always seriously believed that? That's what you were taught growing up. That's what you learned when you joined the church. I mean, that's it. Silent, closed, 33 seconds at least. You believe it with all your heart. You believe that's what God requires. So what do we do with that? Well, I could try to be considerate of your convictions, right? So if you're at my house for a meal, after the blessing, instead of blurting out immediately, pass the ketchup, which you would need a lot of if I did the cooking, you know, I could, I could take into consideration your scruples. I could maintain an attitude of prayer for 33 seconds before proceeding and digging in. Truthfully, I have freedom in Christ to start eating right away. I don't have to wait. But, you know, if doing so would be spiritually damaging to you, then it's probably worth waiting. Actually, if I had done the cooking, a little extra reflection and prayer for a, perhaps a miracle may not hurt, you know. Just give it a little more time to age. But then if you expect me, you know, to preach a sermon about how everyone must wait 33 seconds with their eyes closed after every prayer, realize I'm not going to be able to do that because I don't believe that's a requirement that God makes of Christians. And likewise, don't expect the church to build in a 33-second pause of silence after every prayer in our worship service. Goodness knows we don't have time for that anyways, right? Or let's say that you've come across a great discovery in your personal study, your devotional time of the Bible. You know, you have been studying and suddenly this thing just came to you so clear and it's, it's amazing that everyone else missed it. But God has revealed it to you. And this is what you've determined. You've figured out that because Jesus is depicted in the Bible as being seated at the right hand of God, follow this through now, you have become sincerely convinced that when we have the foot washing service on communion Sabbath, it's clear that the right foot should always be washed first. Right foot in the basin first. Right? It's clearly biblical. Right? You can see that. Okay, you can. But, but this hypothetical person can clearly biblical. So what do you do? Well, if I'm washing your feet and you're washing my feet, we, we could start with the right foot. Because it's important to you and it really makes no difference to me. I was thinking about this. I think I do start with the right foot. Because I'm right-handed, I think. That's why. And I think if you're right-handed, maybe you're right-footed. Is that true? I don't know. Next communion, I'm going to think about that. What foot do I put in first? But you know, you could start with the right foot. But don't expect that guideline to show up in the church bulletin. Make sure when you do the foot washing service, everybody starts with the right foot. Because as sincerely as you might believe this right foot theory that's being revealed to you, the truth is at some point you're going to need to be willing to listen to the counsel of the church. You're going to need to be willing to grow in knowledge that you are, when you are shown that your theory really is not supported by Scripture. It's an interesting, intriguing idea, but really no support. Now, I don't know if any of you believe the two things that I've just said. Hopefully those examples are far enough out there in left field that you're saying, like, whatever, that's ridiculous. That's what I was trying to do. I was trying to get something that you can't personally relate to. And if you do personally relate to that, I mean no offense to you, seriously. But it's not always so easy, is it? There's real things. There's real things that we grapple with. And when it comes to things like the standards of the church, you know the standards of the church. We all know them, right? The standards of the church. We all agree on the standards of the church. Sometimes it's tough to determine who, just who is weak and who is strong in faith. We put out some scenarios right now and said, let's have a discussion. There's a scenario and which, which are the Christians that are strong in faith and which are the Christians that are weak in faith? Let's decide. Do you know how long our conversation would last? Until our death or until Christ comes. We would not be able to come to unanimous agreement on who are the strong and who are the weak in faith. I don't believe. 
it's hard. I remember a little church in uh, Manitoba uh, that I was not at, but a, a church that um, they split. Little town, they ended up having two Seventh-day Adventist churches there because there were some people who very strongly believed that the, whenever you pray, you have to be kneeling down. That's the only attitude of prayer you can have. You must kneel down. Felt very strongly about it. Became so contentious. Eventually just decided to have two churches because they couldn't get, couldn't get past that thing. And it, it happened a bit. One little church that I pastored, some people with that viewpoint came. And it, it was difficult. Little church. Little church. After church, every week we'd have potluck, gather around the table, hold hands, and have prayer in the meal. But it became very uncomfortable because some people said we have to kneel down for that prayer. And some people said, no, we don't. We can stand up. And some people said, well, you know, we can do either, but I guess I'll kneel down because I don't want to offend this person. And other people said, that's ridiculous. And it got so that I didn't even, I just wish we could get done with prayer and eat, you know. It was very uncomfortable. It was very difficult. It became very contentious. And these real-life things where the rubber meets the road. Has that ever happened to you? Someone comes and shares a serious conviction with you? It happens to me. It happens to me as a pastor. What do you do when you don't agree with the conviction, but you still care about the person with the conviction? Do you say, okay, whatever you want so that you'll be happy? Or do you say, I don't, I don't think that's true from the Bible? What do you do? How far do we go in limiting our Christian freedom for the sake of the scruples of the weak brethren? And is there a point at which we actually become enablers of spiritual weakness. Man, that could be a fine line of distinction, can't it, sometimes? Between respecting the convictions of others and perhaps even actually hindering their Christian growth by accommodating their beliefs. Is that easy to figure out? Some I still haven't figured out. I, don't, I'm, I still wrestle with it. Is there a point where I need to just stick my left foot in the basin first and say, you know what, brother? We're here to remember Christ's humility. We're here to, to seek to, to symbolize that and bring it into our own lives. And it really doesn't matter which foot I wash first. Is there a point where you just do that? How do we know? I don't have an easy answer for you. I don't have a cute little formula that you can just put in the various elements and bing, come up with the answer, because it isn't that easy. Bottom line, only the Holy Spirit has to help us individually, as a church, deal with those things one at a time and figure out where best to draw that line. Without his help, man, we are in so much trouble. We're in trouble anyways, but we're in more trouble. It's hard. Now let's move on and consider the uh, last part of Romans 15.1, the part that says, and not to please ourselves. And again, this statement needs to be understood in the context of what Paul is writing. This isn't a statement to just be separated and taken off by itself. Paul isn't saying that you should never do anything that brings you pleasure. He's not calling for Christians to neglect themselves and abuse themselves and have no self-respect. Notice that it doesn't say, as Christians, you should all be downright miserable. You might occasionally meet a Christian who operates from that perspective, but that's not what the Bible says. The fact is that there are definite benefits to being a Christian. God promises his people some good things, things like happiness and peace and joy, which just happen to be pleasing things. In fact, there are Christians who even find pleasure in helping and encouraging those weaker in faith, and that is a special calling. Not to please ourselves. You know, that reminds me of something that I heard and I learned growing up, and maybe you've heard it as well. Something that I was talk, taught back when I was just a little kid. You ever heard this? That as Christians, we should put God first, and others second, and ourselves last. You heard that? Yeah? I realize that there are some people who abuse that concept. But you know what? In, in the balance of the will of God, in a proper relationship with God, the principle is really pretty sound. It's a valid principle. And I think what Paul is saying here in Romans 15.1 is that strong Christians should be willing to make the small sacrifice of not pleasing themselves first 
I want my rights. Not pleasing themselves first, if doing so may cause a weaker Christian to stumble or become confused or become disillusioned. You know, in these, he, what he's saying is, look, in these relatively unimportant things, be willing to take consideration for the weaker Christian's spiritual well-being. Make that a higher priority than just the enjoyment of your own Christian freedom. Now, while it's true that these words of Paul here in Romans 15:1 are found in this context of dealing with the beliefs and scruples of Christians weaker in faith, As I think about what it says here, it seems to me that this principle that's stated here I think could appropriately be applied in a broader sense to maybe all of the weaknesses that we encounter in the church. Because besides these differences among us in our convictions regarding proper Christian behavior, what to eat and not to eat, and how to dress and how not to dress, and how to act and what what to say and what not to say and do, and all of that stuff, besides that, We also have to face the fact that not all members of the church are as strong in their commitment, their loyalty to God or to the church, right? I mean, some are in, full in. And some are in quite a bit, and some are sometimes in, and and some stick their toe in once in a while. That's about it. And those are realities. And then there are weaknesses in abilities. Some members have strong abilities in certain areas. But even in a big church, oh, there's lots of people to do everything. Even in a big church, we sometimes face situations where we don't really have anyone who's really well-equipped or enough people really well-equipped to serve in a certain role. We get by, but it's not very good. could be a lot better. Sometimes we don't seem to have enough people with the ability to really do an exceptional job in a certain area. And sometimes we face this thing, sometimes those who are really strong in commitment and very willing to help, sometimes some of them are weak in ability. And sometimes those who have great ability and could do amazing things for God's cause, they lack a strong faith or a strong loyalty. They could do great things, but they really don't really care to, don't want to expend the energy. And so in a sense, we are all called to bear together the weaknesses of our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's that's real world. And I think perhaps the bottom line of what Paul is talking about here in Romans 15.1, in fact, what he's talking about in this whole section of Romans is the principle of corporateness. As a church, as God's family, we are a group. We are a corporate group. Like it or not, we are a group. You know, this word bear that we find here in Romans 15.1 is an interesting word. Because it can mean simply to bear as in, you know, to take up and carry. Or it can mean to bear with, to endure patiently, to tolerate. And the English translations of the Bible seem to be fairly evenly divided between these two interpretations. For example, New American Standard Bible says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. Well, the Revised Standard Version phrases it like this, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. I don't know, perhaps maybe those two meanings aren't really so very different, but consider the implications if the first idea is what Paul had in mind, to actually bear the feelings of the weak. I mean, to simply put up with or patiently endure or tolerate others and their weaknesses, I mean, that in itself is hard enough, right? Right? But to actually bear or carry those weaknesses, that seems to imply even more. In chapter 12, Paul told the Roman Christians that they needed to love one another with a tender affection. That's challenging. Then in chapter 14, he calls for them to be tolerant and accepting of one another. Could it be that here in chapter 15, he's even kicking it up a notch further? And now he's actually asking them to actually bear one another's weaknesses. Not just tolerate their weaknesses, but actually take up the burden of others' weaknesses on themselves. To take responsibility for those weaknesses as if they were their own. For you see, as a part of the corporate group, the weaknesses of others in the group are your own. You know what? Your weaknesses are my weaknesses. And my gift to you, my weaknesses are yours. You're welcome. You know, I read a little illustration 
about a man who developed a condition known as the Putrin's contracture. I don't know if I'm saying it right, and those with uh, medical knowledge can straighten me out afterwards. He developed this uh, de Putrin's contracture in his left hand. And so he had an operation on that left hand to deal with that, to correct the condition, but there was a consequence to that surgery, and that was that the blood circulation in that hand was impaired. What that meant was whenever the weather would turn cold, so would his hand. But interestingly enough, this man found that whenever the weather turned cold, before he was even thinking about it, his right hand seemed to learn to just automatically take that left hand in its grasp and begin to warm it up, warm it up. And he, he would realize he was doing this without even thinking. It just, it just happened automatically. Now, the man's right hand was fine, right? It was warm and comfortable on its own. But because it was a part of the body, because it was a part of the corporate group, it was willing to help bear the burden of the left hand's weakness to be able to produce warmth. And I thought, what a wonderful illustration of what Christianity is supposed to be about. It's different from the world of sports or business, where if you don't produce, you're out, right? You can't score, you can't defend, you can't add to the bottom line. We don't need you. Go away. We'll find someone better. That's the way it works. But Christianity does not work on the principle of the survival of the fittest. I remember a number of years ago, Sandra and I saw this IMAX film called Africa the Serengeti. I don't know if you ever saw that one. And it showed the migration of the wildebeest across the Serengeti plains, these uh, handsome-looking fellows. And once those wildebeest start running, have you ever seen that thing? I mean, it's like every wildebeest for itself. You see where they just go thundering across the, the plains? And what that means is the slower ones and the, the weaker ones, they're the ones that get eaten by lions and cheetahs, and I'm not showing you those pictures because I hate those pictures. They're the ones that get trampled on because they're not fast enough and their fellow wildebeest behind them just trample them into the dust, literally. They're the ones that get drowned trying to cross the river. They're trying to go across, but they're a little bit weak, and the other wildebeest just jump on them and pound them down and knock them down and knock them down until they drown in the river. Not a scene I particularly care to ever watch again. But God didn't design Christianity as something where only the strong can survive. Rather, Christianity, I'm telling you, is corporate. It's a group thing. A group that does and always will include both the weak and the strong. There is no option for solo Christianity presented in the Bible. We're all in it together. And you know about this, right? Geese provide us with this great example of how the corporate group of Christianity should work. You've seen geese flying, right, most of you? They always fly in that uh, V formation. Have you ever noticed that one side of the V tends to always be longer than the other? Have you ever noticed that? Yeah? Do you know why that is? It's because there's more birds on one side than on the other side. Glad I could clarify that for you. It took a lot of study to figure that out. No, but the scientists, they do study these geese, right? They study these birds, and they've discovered that they fly in this pattern, and you've heard this because it's much more energy efficient than if they fly all spread out. In fact, the scientists estimate that the geese expend up, up to 60% less energy by flying that way. And the reason is the flapping of the wings of the lead goose, followed by the similar action of all the birds behind, creates this uplift of air that gives an extra boost to the ones who are farther back in the formation. Now, of course, the spot that requires the most energy is right there at the point of the V. And because the bird in that lead position, he's facing all the, or he or she, whatever, is facing the most wind resistance, there's no uplift from any other bird to help out. So what happens is they watch these birds is every few minutes, the lead goose, the head honker, if you will, rotates out of that position and another goose comes in and takes its place. Meanwhile, the easiest flying is experienced back at the ends of the Vs, the, the outside parts, the rear sections of the formation. And it's interesting as they watch these geese, the stronger birds, they don't go back there. They permit the younger birds and the weaker birds and the older birds, the senior citizen birds, they occupy those advantageous positions at the back. It's not like everybody has to take their chance at the front. No, the front guys, they rotate in the front, and the weak and, the, and the, the old and the young, they stay at the back. 
Now, if all of the birds were strong, what would happen? The whole flock could probably move faster and get further, couldn't it? If they were all strong, it would be ideal. And if those strong guys said, forget these other guys, we're just going to go ahead, they could make great progress. But what did they do? The geese work within the framework of a corporate group that includes the weak. And likewise, Christianity is corporate. And that is one of the main reasons why change, even desperately needed change in the church, so often comes about so very painfully slowly, more slow than many people would like it to, because we are working within the group. And the group includes all of its limitations and weaknesses and failings and scruples and baffling behavior and decisions. That's the reality. You know, the saying goes that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. I know you're fading. Hang with me here. You know, that's a principle that's true for corporate groups. And yet the unique thing about Christianity is that it is a group with an all-powerful leader. And you know what that means? That means that thus even the weakest link can be strong in Christ. The corporate group can be a good thing. It provides security and acceptance for the weak. You know what? It was very nice for me to feel accepted by Bob and Daryl, my fellow relay running teammates, even though I knew that I was the slowest and the weakest member of that group. It was nice to be a part of that group and share in the glory. They were the stronger members, but it provided security for me. The corporate group provides security and acceptance for the weak as the stronger members help share the burden of their weaknesses. But the corporate group idea can look like a no-win situation to the strong. Are you strong in faith? Are you an intelligent, mature, well-developed Christian? If the strong Christian is expected to help bear with the weaknesses within the group, it looks like a no-win deal. What's the advantage of being strong? Because you're still stuck with this group who's just going to lag along and have all of these issues and problems. And if I have to help with those problems, why be strong? Some people say, well, you know, I, just, I don't need that group. I'm not going to be hindered with the, the insanity of the church. I'm just going to go do my own thing for God, my own ministry, my own personal spiritual, because I'm strong. Paul here is calling strong Christians to a commitment to the principle of corporateness because there is no such valid thing as solo Christianity. Christianity is corporate, and those who choose to follow Christ must choose to follow him within the corporate group of God's family or church, and that means weak members and all. And you know, to do that, it takes true humility. It takes genuine love for a strong Christian to be able to make that commitment, that limitation to function within the church. And when we get frustrated or embarrassed, do you ever get embarrassed by your church? That's good. When you get tired of bearing with the weaknesses of others in the church, Perhaps we would do well to consider this fitting sentence I found written by Ellen White. In Testimonies, Volume 5, 247. The sentence starts out pretty good. It says, We should remember that our brethren are weak, erring mortals. And then it says, Like ourselves. Like ourselves. You know, Jesus Christ in his perfect strength made an amazing commitment to the corporate group of his church by coming here to live and to die and to live again for us. In his perfect strength, in his strength, rather than pleasing himself, what did he do? He bore, he didn't just bear with, he bore our cross because of my weakness and because of your weakness. And that, I just want to say thank God that he chose to stick with the group. And thank God that he's coming back, not for the elite few. Thank God that he's coming back for the group. We are called to follow his example of committing to the corporate group. My friends, Christianity is corporate. And so I leave you with this question in the strength that God has blessed you with, in the faith that you have developed. Are you willing to help bear with the weaknesses 
of your fellow brothers and sisters in this church. I encourage you to think about that as we sing together our closing hymn, 541, Together Let Us Sweetly Live.